Coming up, managing supply chains to fight food fraud. A look at the upcoming IFT First scientific program. And embracing the accidental food scientist. It's all ahead on episode 13 of Omnivore. From the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Calsac, maker of DuraShield natural food protection blends that extend the shelf life while keeping your meat or poultry products label clean. Find out more at calsac.com slash omnivore. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. Food fraud costs the global food industry between 10 and $15 billion a year, according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And it continues to grow. Food Technology's Deputy Managing Editor, Kelly Hensel, spoke with Corvus Blue Principal, Kantha Schelke, about how kinks in the supply chain can open the door to bad actors and what food companies can do to mitigate and repair the damage. Well, thank you, Kanta, for joining me today um, to talk a little bit more about food fraud in the supply chain. I know you mentioned in the article a little bit about how some consumer trends, such as the free from food trend, can be a driver for fraud in the food system. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this and maybe what are some other trends that may be open opportunities for fraudsters? Sure, Kelly. Food fraud and food adulteration is more prevalent today um, because of widespread supply chain issues. So there's raw material shortages, there's growing demand for certain foods, and then there is this free from category, clean label ingredients, clean label foods, and gluten-free foods. So raw materials are in short supply. And when they go in short supply, you know, they, exa- they exacerbate the issue because they often prompt the brand to look past the approved suppliers and then trying to find other um, uh, alternatives. And that sometimes makes them vulnerable for substandard or fake alternatives. Because what is happening is that if it is a new growing trend and it's a new ingredient and the category has just boomed, then you are now reaching out to suppliers who may not be as sophisticated. And so they may think they are making clean label alternatives, but you could be actually dealing with a substandard or a fake alternative if you don't check everything. So that brings up the next point is that obviously the food manufacturers are having to make changes to their supply chains given everything that's happened. What can they do to monitor and prevent fraud in their supply chains? What are those steps that they need to take? The most important one is a personal connection. One of the reasons when you buy something from a farm or where people go to a farm and buy something is because They know the farmer, they see the surroundings, and they understand them. Similarly, if buyers, if companies stay in touch with their suppliers at a personal level, trust me, there is less of a tendency to be frauded and also for the supplier to try and cheat somebody because you've got a personal connection. The second thing that one can do is to really educate yourself on how a particular ingredient is produced. Because if you know how a material is produced, you will know that if something is too good to be true, it is too good to be true. That is uh, true in everything, isn't it? (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, So what, in your opinion, is maybe the most exciting or promising development? It could be a technology, a policy that has strengthened the food system against fraud. A lot of technologies have come in and, um, you know, you've got NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, spectral analysis, uh, chemical test strips. And then there is this sensor technology, which is very new today, because although I talked about personal connections, there's also the sensor technology, very simple technologies that can literally, you know, these sensors can be attached to your phone where you can look at a particular material and get, for example, it's a uh, hyperspectral imaging done very quickly. Every material has a certain property in how it reacts to light, to sound waves, etc. And if you have the right sensor, 
you can very quickly get something about that material. So there's a company called Saber Metrics, for example, in Canada, and its founder, Harj Bajaj, has done a remarkable job with using sensor technologies, very, very simple technologies, so much so that you can have a handheld sensor and walk past tubs of, say, watermelon or cantaloupe or tomatoes, and just by pinging it with different types of waves, sound, light, or otherwise, you can actually get a reflection and an on-the-spot advice or indicator for which one of those tubs is actually ready to be put out on the retail floor because they're riper than the others. Because as materials get ripened, they change, their properties change. So that is one good. Um, Impact Vision and Photonics are other companies that are also working with hyperspectral imaging, where they look at the biochemical and biophysical qualities for very quickly getting some information to say, this fish was farmed or this fish was frozen. They get that information out for you to help separate the fake from what's true. But there's another trend that's happening that is sort of throwing a wrench into the system. And this is this growing trend of analogs. So we all started out with this meat and dairy and egg analogs. You know, so we were taking what they call plant-based or clean label alternatives. And that was fantastic. So companies stepped in using bioinformatics and other creative formulation technologies to develop, say, a milk that looked like milk, felt like milk, but was not necessarily from a cow. Uh, could have been from a nut, but could have also been, say, from a cell-based uh, fermentation technology. But today, there are something even more new. For example, we've got company like uh, Seminole Foods that is making cocoa butter, but without cocoa beans. Um, a company called Melibio is making honey, but without any bees. And then there are companies like Compound Foods and Atomo that are making coffee-like beverages, but without the coffee bean. So if you're a regulator, you're probably scratching your head going, oh my goodness, how do I set rules for this? Because when this is done by a supplier, we call it fraud. But now it's being done by an, a startup, supposedly to be more sustainable, and it's doing exactly what fraudsters used to do. And for me, I teach a class on food fraud. And I always look at this and I, I ask my students, so where does this fall? And it really gets them thinking all, you know, all over again about the definition of fraud, because it's supposed to be economically motivated. So these companies are economically motivated, but they're also doing it with the best of intentions. Well, that just makes the the whole conversation that much more complicated. You're right. Thank you so much for taking the time, Kanta, to talk to me today a little bit about food fraud and the supply chain and how complex of a, a topic it really is. Kantha Shelke is a principal at Corvus Blue, where she helps companies with competitive intelligence, new product and technology innovation, and rapid commercialization of healthful foods and food ingredients. She's also a senior lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. You can read more about new strategies and tactics for fighting food fraud in the June issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment, but first, this word from our sponsor. Multiple factors can affect the shelf life of meat and poultry. High water content, storage temperatures, and processing conditions all promote microbial spoilage and the growth of pathogens. DuraShield Natural Food Protection Blends from CalSAC were designed to take those challenges head on. DuraShield blends combine antimicrobials with proven CalSAC antioxidants, like Herbalox, for a patented synergistic combination that inhibits rancidity and discoloration, extending the shelf life while keeping the label clean. To protect your products and your bottom line, visit calsac.com slash omnivore. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. The IFT First annual event and expo is coming back to Chicago next month. This year's theme is Innovation in a Time of Crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Product innovators, suppliers, researchers, and academics will gather to collaborate and share cutting-edge scientific research that connects the global food system. 
Food Technology Associate Editor Emily Little spoke with Michelle Braun, chair of IFT's annual meeting Scientific Programming Advisory Panel, about what to expect at this year's event. Michelle, thank you so much for joining me to talk about this year's IFT First. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. So for anyone who maybe hasn't attended our event before, what makes IFT First unique as an event and expo? Well, to me, IFT, the professional association, which is the host of IFT First, IFT is much like that friend or family member that always seems to be a step ahead of you. And no matter whether you're planning a get together or an event, such as our annual meeting is an event, or you have an a yet unformulated or unexpressed need, it is that person that almost anticipates the logical next step. As our professional society has been hard at work um, since the last IFT first or our annual meeting, considering our input, our needs, and anticipating those of the future. And as a member and attendee, the thing that sets IFT's annual meeting apart is the strong combination of a robust expo floor and a thoughtful technical program. And both have experienced some evolutions over the last couple of years. There is an ever-expanding set of content platforms brought closer to the expo floor. For example, there are there's addition of new program formats such as fireside chats, and the posters are now wonderfully positioned between the expo or the exhibits and the entrance to the scientific sessions. And then when we ascend to the scientific sessions, I hope you're kind of getting that feeling with me and that anticipation, <laughs> there'll be some familiar aspects from attendance in, in, in previous years, as well as for those who attended last year. For those who weren't able to be present, the setting may be a bit shocking. The rooms are arranged to foster an exchange between attendees and speakers. Content related to the sessions will all be recorded and available for consumption pre and post event. But while we're all convened there on site, the focus will be an exchange, an exchange of information between panelists, among participants, and between those that are gathered together. And we all face questions in our work each day, questions that are being pondered by, by many across our field. And it's those most pressing and prevailing questions that will serve as the topics to be discussed, um, where the audience has the opportunity to actively participate or, or just passively listen, depending on, on where they are on that journey. All of that put together and the feeling it evokes is what makes IFT First unique and, and gives me great anticipation for the meeting to come. I am already so excited just from that description. <laughs> So you talked a little bit about this, but I want to dive deeper into what's new this year in scientific programming. Absolutely. Uh, so the AMSPEP committee has was has been very busy, and we're just a piece of the puzzle of, of how the program comes to life. But the, the task of the AMSPEP committee was taking all the wonderful session submissions that were that, that came in from members or, or people in our field and organizing those, putting together like or dissimilar session submissions that answer specific questions. And so those different perspectives, because nobody arrives at the same answer uh, uh, to the same question, those different perspectives are going to come together in sessions over the course of, of our annual meeting. And those diverse panels will be hosted by trained facilitators who are there to help to uh, drive that exchange that I mentioned, foster that exchange of information so that we've got the foundation of the scientific content. But when we're in the room, it's about the people. It's about the exchange. It's about the discussion. And there are so many people that that play a role in bringing those stories to life. It'd be, you know, the divisions, uh, those session submitters who had an idea back in the fall, or even those folks prior to that, at the end of last summer, who submitted questions that they were facing that they felt were important to bring to life at IFT. So we've really been on a journey that is that that began almost a year ago. And I'm sure we will pick up that journey again at the close of IFT with, you know, even though we'll come together, we'll have great, great uh, discussions over the course of the time. It will lead us to new, new questions that deserve answers and the process will, will pick up again. I love the format of 
questions and that every session is titled as a question, it really drives home this solutions focused angle that I feel we get at IFT first. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. So one other thing that's new this year on the show floor and in the programming are the curated journeys. Can you talk a little bit about that and how attendees can use them to enhance their experience? So one thing that isn't new about (laughs) IFT First this year is the fact that there is so much content, right? It can be difficult to navigate and, and how can I be in five places at once, right? That's 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 really the, the biggest challenge at IFT. Um, and so because there's so much uh, content, it can be difficult to navigate. And from an AMSPEP perspective, we considered the focus areas such as novel technology and innovation, health and nutrition, sustainability and climate, and so on. We also considered the target audience, which was identified by submitters and the topical tracks that help us sort through the numerous and diverse set of session submissions. The work of AMSPEP feeds into a different effort that helps to collect information tailored to interests rather than than topics. And these curated journeys are more related to how we work in terms of are we an investigator, are we a creator? And those also help us to to find our pathway um, to navigate all of that content. So there's there are a lot of different cues that can help us to to zero in on the sessions the meetings, the discussions that are going to be most valuable to each of us uh, to be present in while we're there at the meeting. And then don't forget that the content, the the recorded sessions, the, the science lives on after the meeting. So even if something doesn't sit central, you know, it, check all those boxes of being central to your needs and interests, um, it may be adjacent, it may be in, informative. And so that exists uh, as well after the fact. So it's really the richness of the information um, that that comes from IFT First, the collection of information um, that, uh, again, back to your first question, helps to set IFT First apart from from other uh, meetings that take place over the year. So AMSPAP has thought critically on on bringing diverse voices as well. So uh, not just the deep science, but the application of that science. And, and, And that's also what's valuable, again, in answering those questions that we're all facing so that we have different perspectives in terms of how we integrate the different uh, responses to the questions. So on the last day of the event, we have the innovation lab. What's going on there? The Innovation Lab is an an exciting new immersive setting that allows attendees to consider key questions again, or actually in this case, threats to our ability to produce and access food that either we have faced in the past, we're facing currently, or may face, and sometimes may face again in the future, and allow us to consider solution sets. Uh, For those that visited the platform last year, it continues to evolve from from the format that you uh, experienced last year. Uh, you'll find it again concentrated on one do- on one day and next to the expo floor. It won't be sequestered as it was last year. It's going to be right there in the thick of the action, um, and it's a great way, I think, to consider the collection of content and and prompts that are found within one setting. Uh, distilled with the new topics and ideas that have been discussed over the course of IFT first, right? It's on that last day when our heads are just brimming, brimming full and and spilling over with with the ideas and information that we've collected. And and this can be a place to condense your your thoughts and and maybe even spurn some new ideas and, as the name says, innovation. So one could consider it an inspiration ground. So lastly, Michelle, what are you most looking forward to at this year's event? Well, I'm not unlike uh, other attendees of IFT First in that what I'm looking forward to most is the people. <laughs> and, and so I believe you've gleaned that this format uh, maximizes that opportunity to reconnect um, with colleagues and, and make new connections. Michelle Braun is a nutrition scientist and the current chair of the Annual Meeting and Scientific Programming Advisory Panel for IFT. She most recently worked as the Director of Stakeholder Engagement at Benson Hill. As an undergraduate at Penn State, innovation consultant Julie Mann initially thought she wanted to study nutrition. 
but the range and diversity of food science changed her mind, and that set the path for her future career in product development. In this month's dialogue essay, she writes that too many young people are still stumbling into the discipline by accident. I caught up with Julie to talk about her own journey and her thoughts about how the profession can do a better job finding and embracing the accidental food scientist. Julie, thanks for coming on the Omnivore podcast. I'm very happy to be here. You write about this concept of the accidental food scientist, but you're really describing yourself, right? I mean, you set out to study nutrition, ultimately decide it wasn't for you. So for people that haven't read the article yet, walk us through a little bit of, you know, what your exploration was and what your journey was um, that led you to food science. Sure. So I was an overweight child and really struggled with food and nutrition and healthy eating. But when I looked at nutrition as, you know, I was, I was leaving high school and I was saying, what can I do that really is going to make me feel good about like, I'm a, I'm a people person. I'm a helper of people. So I'm like, what can I do that will move the needle a little bit um, to, to really get folks able to eat better nutrition in an easy way. Because what I found was, yeah, I knew that I could eat healthy, but it it wasn't particularly easy to do. So I investigated nutrition. I thought, well, this is perfect for me. I'm going to help people be more nutritious. I'm going to help them make better choices. Uh, And so I started out in that endeavor, which is a very noble, um, career path. However, I I started uh, an internship and I worked with a few doctors and at the time, at least, I mean, again, this is, this is, you know, a pretty significant number of years ago, the doctors just ignored what the nutritionists had to say. And, and, you know, I'm not saying every doctor, but in the hospital, I was shadowing, they were kind of like, let us do our job. Thank you for coming in. And, and here I am an intern saying, do I really want to be in a place where nobody's listening to me? Right. A gut feeling that was sort of like, is this right? Is this not right? Should I look for new things? And that's when I stumbled upon food science and yeah, so it was very accidental. And a lot of people who are probably watching this, you know, 90% of the people I talked to in food science, it was similarly accidental for them as well. You talk about having a pretty transformative meeting with Dr. Bob Roberts, who's the chair of the food science department at Penn State. What was it about that meeting that influenced you so much? I was very young, very inexperienced. And I think I got frustrated one day and I I just said, I got to do something. I have to do something. I can't just sit here and like wait for things to happen. I'm going to go and, and it was, you know, I paged through that big, thick book today. It would be tapping through a million screens on your computer, but we had a book and, and I literally, it was, it was completely random. Nobody had told me about it. So I found the major walked up to the food science department and it was at the time they now have a beautiful, um, gorgeous new labs, uh, and building, but this was the Borland labs, which are like the old, um, animal husbandry labs, very, um, look like came out of, you know, uh, the dark ages, but walked in, stumble down this hallway, find the main office. And they say, can I help you? I'm like, yes, I, you know, I need to talk to somebody. I think I want to move into food science. And they were kind of a little shocked at the administration desk. And they said, oh, go down the hall to Dr. Roberts. He's in the, he's in the dairy lab. So walk down the hall and walk in and he's, you know, doing an experiment with yogurt and cultures and, and he's working hard with his grad students. And, and I just said, I want to talk to you about this. And so what was interesting was he immediately took time. He, he did not pause and say like, sorry, you're going to have to come back at this appointment or at this time, because I'm too busy for you. You know, he fixed a few things and he was like, oh, what, what do you want to talk about? And I said, I, I think this is interesting major. Can you tell me more about it before I decide? 
And he spent probably 45 minutes to an hour with me just randomly, um, made me feel cared about, made me feel important. Um, and also just gave me the confidence that, you know, this isn't permanent. If you love it, we, great. You'll be a part of our, our class. If not, you know, there's a lot of other majors out there. But I think somebody taking the time and then also sharing what it's really about was what really, you know, kind of transformed that for me. So, Julie, one of the things that you wrote about that you said really intrigued you was the range of disciplines that food science entails. And, you know, that list of disciplines has only gotten broader and more complicated over the years. Project forward a little bit. Talk about what you think are some of the key skills and knowledge areas that you think uh, are really going to be critical for the next generation of food scientists. Yeah. I mean, I think if you, if you think about food science, it's, you know, I didn't want to commit to chemistry. I don't want to commit to biology. I don't want to commit to one single thing. Um, I saw food science as my opportunity to be able to do a lot of things, which was very exciting to me because I'm not a very linear person. So when you look at all those disciplines that come together for food science, it has changed and it is changing and morphing as we speak today. The typical scientific disciplines are still the, the foundation of, of what food science is. However, I would say, you know, colonology, um, work around new um, agricultural seeds and, and um, genetics that make better crops, um, innovation, um, you know, working with people who can really push the needle on how to make something better, how to improve it with consumer insights. Um, all of these things you might sit there and say, well, great. Okay. So now you're just saying food science plus marketing plus, you know, colonology plus agriculture. And, and there's more, I mean, I could, I could go on and on about this, but I think that the trick is that there's an ecosystem forming and it's more interconnected than it ever was. And I think we need to make sure, you know, as food scientists and, and as we're educating new, new kid, kids, um, students in food science, this is an ecosystem where you, you can kind of bring your best self to what we're doing. It's not like, oh, you're a chemist. You do chemistry every day. Hopefully you're good at it. If not, so sorry. Um, I think it's more you bring who you are every day to work and you can you can leverage, okay, I'm good at colonology, I'm good at sensory, and I really love consumer insights. You can build a whole new job based on that. You can build a new job title. So the change is that we're we're pushing the limits of of where this industry needs to go. So what do you think are some of the biggest barriers right now to getting young people excited about food science? They, they don't understand what the premise of food science is. Like we study food, we make food safer, we make food tastier, we bring delight to your taste buds. We we work on all of those areas. And I think the, the biggest challenge is overcoming. They just don't know what it is. They've never heard of it. So it's it's very foreign to them. And what they do, it, your brain is hardwired to do this. All of those things are what we study, but they don't they don't see it that way. They see it as face value. And I think our job is to help them get excited and understand there's there's three, four or five levels beneath. So in the essay, your call to action to your peers is effectively to get involved, to, um, you know, think about ways that they can reach out and help cultivate this next generation. Just in practical terms, what does that look like? What are some of the ways that you that you personally are, are getting involved? What are ways that you think that your peers can get involved? I'm not suggesting that we all become, you know, the next guidance counselor and try to encourage everyone to go to food science, but you have ways you can show up every day in a different way and talk about this. Um, you know, junior achievement, I've been to junior achievement, I've been to um, just just anything around me that I know is going to reach 
somebody at a younger age. We can't start educating them when they're high school seniors. It's too late. We need to be reaching down further in the in the K through 12, maybe K through nine area where we can actually, you know, show them how exciting it is, show them what what kind of cool things they can be doing with food. And so my call to action was more, you know, do what you can do locally first, like start small, you know, everyone's busy. I get it. Start with something close by easy to do. If you really find more passion around that, we're building a lot of networks and ecosystem through IFT, through myself, through colleges around myself that I'm oriented with or associated with. And I'm learning there's other folks in pockets all over the US and probably the globe doing this. So my goal is to build an interconnected network so that we can talk about it in a broader way and really bring resources. Julie Emsing Mann is a food and beverage innovation advisor for Appropriately Rogue Consulting and a current member of IFT's Board of Directors. Her dialogue essay appears in the June issue of Food Technology. IFT members can share their own thoughts about attracting the next generation of food scientists by visiting our members-only forum, IFT Connect. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, CalSec. Protecting your products and your bottom line with DuraShield Natural Food Protection Blends. Learn more at calsac.com slash omnivore. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine, or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.